Welcome to the The Low Carb Carb Athlete Athlete Podcast, Podcast. where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey guys, it's Debbie, and have you used a CGM before? CGM is Continuous Glucose Monitor, and there's different options out there. Ideally, you can get it from your doctor, but they seem to just want to wait until you're type 2 diabetic and not be preventative. I would like us to take ownership of our health and make choices now to prevent having high, low glucose readings and optimize your health from the inside out by testing and not guessing. And that includes a CGM that goes on for 14 days and you can order one via NutriSense. And a CGM is giving you glucose updates with a small device on the back of your arm, 24 seven. Totally easy, I actually did a video on my YouTube channel, Low Carb Athlete, how to apply this CDM, first time, kind of scared, but it doesn't hurt. But it gives you real-time glucose readings. Glucose response to meals, you'll learn about what foods are reactive to you, and that could be a healthy food that you think is great, but it could raise your glucose. Simple things as stevia, for me, raise my glucose. Chewing gum, raise my glucose. Stress, when I'm driving a car and there's traffic, raises my glucose. Every stress response is a glucose response. So learn how to manage your stress. Learn learn how to pick right foods for you, unless you can, you know, do other lab testing and figure out vibrant wellness food zoomers, but it's kind of expensive for people. So if you can wear a CGM, it's a great way to learn about stress, food, exercise, stacking movement with your nutrition, figure out how to balance your blood sugar. So we want to learn more about how to exercise and eat or not eat. And morning cortisol, does it raise your glucose? If there's hidden stressors at nighttime, does your glucose go up higher while you're sleeping? So it gives us lots of clues that we can put in our investigation when we are working on your personalized fueling training and performance program to improve fat loss, performance, and longevity. So head to NutriSense website, NutriSense.io, how it works. You can learn more about your habits, your routines, your relationship to food, a little bit more, great app to use, and it can sync on to different programs. So you can put it all together. So if you want to get started with your journey in NutriSense, I suggest this to all my clients. Use at least 30 days. So you can do a 30-day, 90-day different programs, but you can pick which one you want. You get the sensor in the mail, put it on, last for 14 days, sync it to the nap, and get your readings on there. And then if you're doing my VIP coaching program, I'm working with you to correlate this data together. So begin your health optimization journey with NutriSense, and you can save on your order with our code, as usual, low carb athlete. So no carbs is not our goal, it's carb timing and using NutriSense, can, you can help figure out your nutrient dense whole food plan and when to adjust your macros based on your exercise intensity duration based on your life stressors and learn more. So it's nice to have this data. So test and not guess with NutriSense. Let me know how you like it. All right, guys, I am bringing you Joe Friel on the podcast today. So if you are my age range, you may have heard of Joe Friel if you started as long as I did in triathlons. Gosh, I started Dan Skin triathlons in 1995, and then I started doing Ironmans 2001 and coaching athletes way back when, and Joe Friel his training Bible book was always something I used as a resource manual. He recently spoke at the San Diego Tri Club a meetings. He had presented his new fifth edition book, and I really wanted to get him on the podcast. So I found him, got him on the show, and I definitely need a few more episodes with him. He is filled with knowledge and years of experience. 
He is a lifelong athlete and has a master's degree in exercise science. Joe has trained and worked with amateur professional endurance athletes from a wide variety of sports since 1980. Based on his experience, he co-founded trainingpeaks.com, which I use all the time. I did not even realize. <laughs> oh my gosh. I should know that, but he, I didn't know he co-founded Training Peaks, 1999. I've been using Training Peaks for my athletes for a long time. And his son, you might have read articles that were done by Dirk Friel. That would be his son. And his friend, Gear Fisher, they all started Training Peaks. Amazing. Now, Joe currently coaches just a few athletes. He mostly focuses on training emerging top-level coaches on best practices practices in preparing endurance athletes for competition. This regularly takes him to coaching seminars all around the world, which I would love to do. He consults with corporations in the sports and fitness industry and national Olympic governing bodies worldwide. His training Bible books for road cyclists for mountain bikers and triathletes are used by several national sports federations to train their coaches. So the training Bible book is something I've used many times over my coaching career. And you definitely need to get his new fifth edition copy because Joe updates it. And we'll talk about that in the podcast today. His philosophy and his methods for training athletes was developed over 40 years ago and is based on a strong interest in sports science research and has experienced training hundreds of athletes with a wide range of abilities. So we talked today about his fifth edition, what changed from the first edition to this edition, even from the fourth edition, and what does he see, what science is changing in, in his experiences, what heart zones have evolved to and the popularity of zone two and testing with lactate threshold versus metabolism testing versus formula. So we talk about all that stuff today. You might have seen some of his articles. He's been in Velo News, Bicycling, Bicycling Magazine, Outside Magazine, Runner's World, Women's Sports Fitness, and the list goes on. So he's been a big influence in our world in triathlons and endurance sports. He now lives and trains in the mountains of Sedona, Arizona. So I would definitely, if you haven't been to Sedona, it's a great place to go hiking and trail running. And the scenery is amazing. And just make sure you stay hydrated because it's at elevation. I think about 4,000, 5,000 feet. And it gets hot there in the summertime. And I would for sure follow joe's website i put the link in the show notes and anything else let me know we'll try to get him back on the show for a follow-up because we had about five minutes to go over topics that we could have discussed for an hour so so much to dive into just one hour i try to keep these podcasts episodes too but uh yeah check out the youtube channel because i shared some screen on metabolic testing so it might be better visual and let us know what you think and what your experiences have brought you to training differently, fueling, and how you are adjusting your training as you age. So send in your questions. Talk soon. Enjoy the show. Hey, you guys. It's Debbie Potts, and I am looking forward to this next guest on the show, Joe Real. We are going to talk about updated version of triathlon Bible. If you are a triathlete as, well, I wouldn't say as old as I am or doing triathlons as long as I have. I started back in 2001 doing my first Ironman and ugh, 1995 doing dance again triathlons, the sprint tries. And I remember this book early on. So this is a new version and came out. And this is definitely the world's most comprehensive training guide, the fifth edition. So we're going to dive in to Joe Friel's book, Any Changes. It is the ultimate guide for triathletes. If you don't know about it, you must get the book. And it's not just for triathletes. If you're a swimmer, cyclist, or runner, it goes into all those different sports as well as how to figure out your zones, as I talk about as I do Pinoy Metabolic Testing here in North San Diego. 
And we want to know how to measure. So we can't manage what we can't measure. So if we can figure out where our baseline is, doing a metabolic test or doing some of the formulas that are in this book and really figure out what are your training zones. I know I use five zones. Joe's is a little bit different, I think. And then talking about how you can manage your training stress. We used to say train hard, recover harder. How can you improve your recovery? And if you've been following my YouTube videos on epigenetics, looking at your genetic reports, figure out how best you can, should train based on your genetics and sport you're training for. Perhaps you're similar to me that I need more recovery. Example, today I went for a run and I haven't ran since Tuesday, today's Friday, and actually felt pretty good. But when I run back-to-back -back days, not so great. I'm kind of a slug and it's more of a slog, a run and a jog and a walk in there. So it's ideally for me, I schedule my workouts where I have enough recovery time in between and really personalizing our training program as well as fueling. And that also includes how you recover and repair so you can perform stronger and get faster the next time you train. So we want to see hopefully progress in what we're doing and really figure out, we'll talk about planning your season, planning by your quarter, the month, the week to week, and how to track. Should you use a Garmin watch? Should you use Aura? Should you use Whoop? You know, what? how are you measuring and tracking your progress? Everyone's different. But also, are you doing too much? I think a lot of times we use too many pieces of data and forget to just listen to our body. Intuition. How do I actually feel? And pay attention to yourself, to your own innate intelligence, to your intuition, I need to make adjustments today. This workout is not going as planned. I decided, say, to go for a walk instead of a run if I felt tired. Or maybe you start and you wait 15 minutes and you don't feel better and then you turn around on your bike or you run. Or maybe you do a swim workout and the send-offs feel a little too hard today. Maybe you need to just do it a recovery workout. So I think we need to track, measure heart rate, heart rate variability, measure your sleep scores, but also check in, take inventory, see how you feel. And I think we forget about that. We're relying on all this external gadgets, which actually estimate, you know, getting my sleep scores from my uh, finger or, you know, the back of a wrist watch may not be as accurate as if someone put electrodes on my head and measured what's going on sleeping is going to be a little different as well as wearing a chest strap getting true heart rate variability score. So we'll talk to Joe Friel about that as well as what to do as an aging athlete. You know, I keep talking about as I turn 50, I want to get stronger. I want to get faster. I need more power. And that involves getting more strength, building more muscle and focusing on less chronic cardio, so to speak, and more time lifting heavy things and short, intense interval trainings. That's what my body needs. I know I lack, and I feel I lack fast twitch muscle fibers. So I need more speed work and that's where I struggle. And so you need to identify your area of opportunity and work on that. Instead of that definition of insanity is doing the same program, the same routine over and over again, expecting different results. So I think it's important to personalize our program. You might be getting your programs off training peaks, generating just a basic program, a template, and then be sure to make adjustments with that. So what we'll look at is some information Joe Friel has on his website, joefreeltraining.com, a quick guide to setting heart rate zones. So he has some links on his website. I'll put in the show notes know how to figure out your training zones. If you can't come see me in North San Diego, I'm doing metabolic testing in Solana Beach and Del Mar areas so North San Diego. So he has some training zones, but see this zone five, he has broken up into A, B, and C. 
Remember, your run zones are going to be different than your bike zones. So when we do your metabolic test, we want to make sure we do a bike and a run test. So we'll talk about that, talk about lactate threshold testing. So LTHR is what he looks at. So we'll figure out what that is. Keep in mind also that if we do metabolic testing, you know, this is example from Pinoes, obviously a Greek company. If you look at any of the names of people that work for Pinoe, they're all P words, but this is a sample report. And when we do metabolic testing, you get this report back afterwards, but then I customize it to you. What have you been doing? What do you need more work on doing? And that's figure out where your scores are less than neutral. So I want to be good or excellent. And those areas we score neutral limitation or severe limitation, we want to identify those, figure out why and how to improve that. So you bring all these levels up together because your body works as a whole holistic approach that we want all these systems working together. So your heart, lungs, and cells. So we can get this report, identify where we need to work on your weak link and figure out your training history, nutrition history, but then what is lower? So for example, metabolic fitness, how do you improve that? So we can identify what you're not doing enough of and maybe restructure your training program and figure out what that is. So we go through figuring out your fat burning efficiency, which is your RER score from your resting test and during our exercise test. And then we can figure out your breathing analysis, cognition while you're at exercise. So we can get all this information and this is the resting test I'm showing you, but we can get what is your calories a day at rest without exercise and then what is your need for exercise days and then figure out your macros. So that is a resting metabolic rate report. I was just thinking I was pulling up the other one. But we want to get that data and help figure out what's best for you. So the active metabolic rate will help us identify your training zones. And then we can figure out, all right, let's see what you need to do to improve your performance or is it fat loss. So the metabolic test, we're going to get aerobic health, cardiovascular system measured. We're going to look at your high intensity, your performance when you're at those high zones. And then we're going to measure how well do you lower back down into that zone one after we hit your VO2 peak? How well do you burn fat during the test? As we look at, you know, your resting metabolic rate, how well do you burn fat at rest? Do we need to improve that? And then how do you burn fat at different intensity levels as you're doing the training? So from this, we can figure out your areas of opportunity during exercise, as well as at the rest, figure out some nutrition, exercise, lifestyle habits, what you could do. So we'll individualize that program for you and then figure out personalization of which nutrition habits you could adjust and it course correct. Again, it's experiment and you are the expert of yourself. So we'll figure that out. And then we can identify the five training zones. So we'll go back and talk to Joe Friel in a moment. Looking at his chart, you can see setting the heart rate zones. If you can do a test, you know, that's a real time what we're looking at. So let's bring on Joe and we'll learn more about what he says, how to find these five zones, where we should train in, how do we improve these areas, and how do we fuel for that? So interesting to hear what he has to say. So let's bring on Joe and see what you can learn. Pick up his book, The Training Bible. Okay, guys, I've got the master, Joe Friel. Talk about the new edition of The Training Bible, the most comprehensive training guide. And I'm so excited. You talked to us at the San Diego Tri Club a few months ago, and I tracked Joe down and got a hold of him. So I'm excited to have him on our podcast today. Thank you, Joe. Well, thank you, Debbie. I'm, I'm happy to be here and looking forward to it. So tell us a little bit about your passion for helping educate people because this book, fifth edition, when did the first year come out? 
Oh, the very first edition came out about 1997, I believe, something like that, right around there. Yeah, that's about. That was that's that was the fifth, first edition. This, this is the fifth edition you're holding up there. So it's been like, I don't know, every five years or so, I revise the book or rewrite it entirely. And um, anyway, it's uh, it's, been a, it's been like a major project in my life. Ongoing journey. Life is yeah. a training Bible keeps suggesting and you're learning stuff that's new. What's your why? Why do you keep wanting to keep sharing it and doing all the hard work? Oh, it's mostly, I'm just curious. Um, um, this, this is how this whole thing got started for me back when I was, I don't know, in, in uh, the 1970s, I suspect. Um, I was starting to become very serious about my training. I was running marathons. And uh, I decided, I had a degree in, in exercise science, so I decided I could probably learn a little bit more about this this topic of how to train. And so I started reading everything I could find out, which at the time wasn't a whole lot. And uh, which forced me to come up with my own ideas of how to train. And so I started making notes and writing things down and gathering stuff. I had a whole notebook full of my notes from back in the 70s. I've still got it someplace on my bookshelf. And it's just just random thoughts and things I've read and questions I have and all kinds of stuff. And and so over the years, I simply just kept trying to uh, refine my my own training. And finally, it was about 1980, I opened a running store in Colorado. In fact, it was probably about the fifth running store in the U.S. Because back in those days, if you wanted to buy running equipment, running shoes or whatever, you went to a general sporting goods store where they sold basketballs and, and helmets and all kinds of stuff for other sports. And they would sell you your running shoes, and they, didn't, they knew absolutely nothing about running shoes. So I decided I would open a running store in this little bitty town I was in and uh, just start promoting how to, how to train along at the same time. And so I just had a string of people coming in the door all day long asking me how to prepare for a 5K or a 10K. And three years later, I did my first triathlon and uh, fell in love with the sport and decided to uh, I make my shop into a triathlon store. So I bought the bike store next door, took out the wall between and had the very first, probably the very first triathlon store in the world, 1983. The world was not ready for a triathlon store in 1983, I discovered. But nevertheless, it was fun. And so I, I did it and I lost a lot of money, but uh, long-term it's probably the best thing I ever did. And so that started bringing triathletes in the front door. And because of selling bikes, I started getting cyclists in the front door and so I started doing bike races. I was doing running races, triathlons, and bike races, and, and I enjoyed all of it. And um, eventually, I was asked to to write a book, and that's a long story. Also, I turned it down at first, and then like two years later, I changed my mind, and so I wound up writing the cyclist training bible, and then uh, after that, the triathlete's training bible. Never to get a runner around to writing the runner's training bible. That's always been in the back of my head, but I probably won't write that. <laughs> So I, I'm probably going to stop at this point with training Bibles. <laughs> That's funny. That's amazing. So do, do you happen to know Sally Edwards? That seems similar to her background. Yeah, sure with do. Feet. Yeah. yeah. And her books. And I used to help her with heart zone training and dance skin camps years ago. Okay. Yeah. I've seen her years ago. It's been a long time for me too. Yeah, that's amazing. Small world, I'm sure, in that community, especially back in the 80s. And that's what, it's, you know, I'm in San Diego now, I moved from Seattle a few years ago down to San Diego, and it's the birthplace of triathlon, and we're planning the 50th anniversary of triathlon and the 40th anniversary of San Diego Tri Club, so it's pretty amazing. Oh, great. <laughs> it's 50 years since triathlon world started in the Bud Light series and all of that back then. Oh, fantastic, fantastic story, and I always enjoy going back and reading the details about how the sport got started. Um so it's I'm, I'm I was glad to be able to speak to the club the other night because I realized how important this this club is uh, to the history of the sport, and mm -hmm. so it's always fun for me to, to talk with people like that who have been around who 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 are associated with what's been around for a long long time. Well, yeah, uh, especially great. Bob Babbitt, you know, is down here. Oh, yeah. The history of it, it's great. Yeah, yeah. this is amazing. You can be a part of that and share that journey with everyone. Your journey. So let's dive into the book. What are some of the, just start off, big changes you found from the 
you know, fourth to fifth edition, even from the first edition to the fifth edition? Yeah, uh, basically, I've rewritten the book from the first edition. It's not the same book at all anymore. The only thing I kept is I kept the table of contents. I thought that was well designed, but then I just changed everything about the contents when I went on went on to write the book. And uh, the biggest the biggest change, I suppose, is I changed intensity zones. That's by far the biggest. I came up with a heart rate zones back in like 1987, I think it was, just really based on the people I coached. I, I would bring them in and and I would uh, do some very basic testing with them indoors, like on a bicycle, for example, or a treadmill. And uh, I'd watch their heart rates while things were going on. I'd ask about their their rating of perceived exertion or RPE. And this is before we had any lactate measurements. So I'm just, I'm just gathering data, all the data I can. And from that, I started putting together zones from what I saw all my clients doing. And uh, did the same thing for the bike and the run. Um, swim was a little bit different. I based it on on uh, on, on uh, pace as opposed to anything like heart rate because it wasn't available in those days. But anyway, so that, that's how it came about, and that's that's the biggest change I've made. And basically, um, I've gone from from uh, yeah, I've gone to many ways of figuring out what your your zone should be. I, it used to be that it was just one way; it was my way or the highway. You just did what I said, and that's how you got your zones. And people kept telling me over many many years that the most common thing I heard was that zone one seemed like it was a little bit too high. The upper end was a little bit too high. And so I took that into consideration and over the years began to realize they're probably right. And so I went back and started making changes. And I, I, all that became kind of like written into this newest edition. So I've got all the changes written in there. And so I've got, you know, you can use your maximal heart rate to figure out what your zones are. If you want to, that's one way of doing it. You can use a 20-minute test, which I've been using for a long, long time. It's another way of just deciding your, your zones. You can use a lactate test. Um, if you have access to a lab or you like to do the lactate testing yourself. Um, so you can do any of those things. And then I set up these, these are how you go about using what you discovered to set up your zones. And the reason why I made that change and made it so flexible is essentially because I've I've come to realize over the years that basically heart rate when you're using it or in any zone system, power zone or pace zone or whatever, is very largely um, based on the individual. Uh, it's hard to say this is exactly what it should be for every person who runs or rides a bike or whatever it may be. That's a really um, kind of a, a, a ridiculous way of looking at it. Everybody's different in so many ways. So how you find your heart rate zones is really up to you as far as I'm concerned, because they're, they're, they are they're overlap, the zones overlap. There's nothing about them that are perfect. They're not, they're not magical. If you go to, you know, a few beats above or below the zone you're supposed to be in, doesn't mean you're not getting any benefits from it that we're trying to get. So the, so I began to realize that I probably had written too much into the, the importance of these zones as being having particular numbers that are associated with it. So let's just loosen up the whole thing and say, let's just, you can figure it out any way you want to using these three types, these three examples. And I'll give you a set of zones, which are not perfect, but they'll get you started and you can refine it as you go on. So that was the number one change I made in the book. The other changes beyond that are all rather insignificant compared with that. Um, but the biggest thing I suppose I changed after that was the, the emphasis on not being, not turning quite so hard. I, I think, I think self-coached athletes, for the most part, train too hard. Mm -hmm. They push themselves to their limits almost daily. If they're supposed to do a, a zone one workout that day, they'll decide it's better to be a zone two, so I'll just run zone two. If it's supposed to be zone three, they'll decide zone four should be better because it's faster, so I'll do zone four. So yeah. the zones become almost useless after a while because the athletes don't pay any attention to them. The reason why is because they think the only thing that's important is high intensity. Uh, but if you look at the pros, the ones who make money off of doing this, they don't do that. If their coach has told them to train in zone four, they train in zone four. They don't train in zone five. 
uh, because they think it feels like they're getting more out of it. They don't do that. That's that would be asinine. If your if your job is to make money off of the sport, you would not make any money at all if all you did was overtrain all the time. So I kind of emphasize that that how important it is to make sure you're you're staying and you're keeping things when it's easy. It's really easy. It's not just something that you're giving lip service to. So that that's the second biggest change I suspect is that. And, and there's lots of changes, but those are the two biggest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what about, I know I learned from Sally Edwards, heart zone training. I said like 1995 or whatever. We started doing that. So she taught me that and I led seminars. And then Maffetone, Phil Maffetone taught me the max aerobic function heart rate. And I trained with Mark Allen on his elite team back in 2003. And before that, you know, I was already doing the math formula thing. And so how do you, how do you implement that into any of your testing? Is that something you suggest as well? Yeah. Interesting. I don't, I don't uh, bring it into my testing, but I, I just spoke to a group uh, where it was in Albuquerque last week. And I talked to them about this uh, math, the math tones, MAF math test, uh, which is basically 180 minus your age. And and why we do why you can do that why why it works I, I remember back in the day back in the eighties when Bill was talking about that I kind of poo pooed it because it just didn't it seemed like it was too easy because I was kind of stuck with hard training back in those days. But obviously, Mark made some great uh, advancements in his training and performance, and I'm, I'm certain a lot of it had to do with the fact that what was Phil was doing with him. So I've kind of reversed my position on this whole thing. I think, you know, basically what it does, what he was trying to do was to get Mark and other athletes he was coaching, like yourself, I assume, was trying to get athletes to train at, a, at, at an aerobic, really, really an aerobic uh, effort, not at something we call aerobic, but it's really not, like zone three, zone four. We, we tend to call that aerobic, but in the, the bigger definition of what we call aerobic, that's not true. Aerobic. Metabolic aerobic fitness is when you're burning fat for fuel. That's your primary source of fuel. And that's what Phil was trying to get his athletes to do is to burn fat for fuel. You've got something like 50,000 calories stored away as fat in your body, even among the skinniest athletes. And you've only got about 2,000 calories of carbohydrates stored away as glycogen. So um, it's silly to waste your, your glycogen when you've got so little of it and and not to use this gigantic reservoir of energy you have called fat by training too hard or racing too hard. And so what and you can improve the, the relationship between fat burning and carbohydrate burning by with your training, which is what Phil was trying to do. He's trying to get people to train easy enough that their body becomes begins to burn more fat for fuel and they they can go faster at low intensities, like a low heart rate, they can go faster. Uh, and still be burning burning fat, which is perfect for an Ironman distance race. If Mark Allen is trying to, you know, trying to um, to, to come off that bike with a fast split, he's, he's going to do it in the two zone. That's what he's going to do, or, or high two zone, possibly low three zones. That, that's where he's going to be. He's going to be burning fat doing that. So he comes off the bike, he's still got lots of sugar left. He can still use glycogen. During the run, if he has to speed up, he can do it. He's not going to be running low on on fuel. Doesn't mean he doesn't have to refuel during the race because you're still burning some carbohydrate, but you're, you're burning. He was burning primarily fat. So it, it was basically it was a, it was a, a um, great idea that Phil came up with. Um, I'm seeing it being used more now today. That the concept is being talked about more again today than it was back then. And as far as I know, he was the first guy to actually be talking about such a thing. So I have my hats off to him for what he's done mm-hmm. for for the sport and uh, for athletes in terms of um, burning fat for fuel. Yeah, it's funny because it's 2024 as we speak. And I We started this podcast 12 years ago and it used to be called, someone asked me to co-host it called Fit Fast Fit Fat Fast. So eat fat to burn fat and train to your body to burn more fat and be more metabolically efficient, more fat adapted. And no, no, not many people really were familiar with that. And I did new leaf metabolic testing back in 2005. So we were doing the metabolic cart and figuring out where people burn the most fat. But fast forward to the past couple of years, zone two seems to be this big thing because of, I always say Dr. Peter Atia is really 
slotted up into training and other leading podcast doctor influencers that really have gotten this mainstream people to realize, oh, I need zone two and I need hit training. And so the big buzzword last couple years, I think, is that zone two, which I don't think people fully understand it that aren't in our endurance world where we've been talking about this for 30 years. Money. Right. Yeah, I don't I don't think athletes fully grasp why zone two is important or, or even zone one. I wouldn't I wouldn't yeah. negate it. Basically, low intensity training is good for burning fat. Um, and the faster you get you can get at water you're burning fat, the faster you race, especially long distance. That's you know, iron man, half iron man. If you if you're excellent at burning fat, that's that's a huge advantage you have already just by the fact you're burning fat. You don't get faster by going out and doing one zone higher than what you're supposed to be doing that day, you know, going from zone two to zone three or zone three to zone four. That does not make you faster because you're all you're doing is burning more sugar. You're not burning, you're not burning fats, you're burning carbohydrate, glycogen for fuel. So we've got to so, so the whole idea, and this, this actually originated with uh in Yosan Milan, he's a uh PhD. He's on all the podcasts. College. Yeah. He's uh he's the one influenced, I believe, Atia also, and, and many, many others. I, I've known uh, Inigo, since he was a college student, he went to school with my son, college uh, back in the 19, oh gosh, 1980s. And um, so I've known, he, and he's, he was a really good cyclist and um, very smart guy. And I've, I've learned a lot from him also over the years. But uh, I think it really kind of originated with him. In fact, he was telling me a story the other day that he had gone to Italy to speak at a conference and he was in a taxi going to the conference, got to talking to the driver, um, found out the driver was a cyclist and started talking about cycling. And the driver said, what do you think about this zone two stuff? <laughs> and so in you go, got to talk to this, the, 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 he's, at, he's at the heart of the issue by talking, by asking that question of Indigo. So then you go is telling this cab driver who has absolutely no idea who this guy is. He's talking to about the importance of zone two. Uh, so it's become like worldwide, uh, crazy. Just, gosh, not too long a period of time, like the last year, 18 months, something like that. It's become like really well known. Uh, so anyway, it's a very interesting topic. And it's something that athletes need to pay attention to is training in low intensities, not just high intensities all the time. So can we just push pause for a second? Let's look at, I should backtrack, the five, you do five zones, but you break the five, zone five into a, B, and C, pretty much. Let's just kind of overview of the training zones and what fuel source is used and when sure. we would use that zone for training. Yeah, yeah zone one is uh, basically the fat burning zone. And most athletes are already able to operate in zone one, uh, burning fat, uh, but not all. There are some athletes who still are burning primarily carbohydrate, even when they're in zone one because there's in okay. such poor condition which is not unusual you, you can go out on the street you can find any person you want mm -hmm. walking down the sidewalk and you can if you test them you find out they're probably burning sugar just walking down the sidewalk mm -hmm. uh, because we're so poor at at aerobic fitness in this country but a little bit different with athletes so that's zone one it, it's so you can if you want to really burn fat get in zone one that's going to burn fat zone two is what we'd like to have become your fat burning zone also. Like in other words, we'd like to extend your fat burning zone from zone one into zone two as far as we can. Um, I'm writing a book right now where I just just drew up a chart on that particular uh topic. In fact, I'm looking at the chart right now, I got just hand drawn it over to my left side on my on my desk, where I so drawing what zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, and what's happening with with fat versus uh, carbohydrate burning in each of those zones. And there's there's one particular part. And when you start, like in zone one, um, fat burning is very high. Carbohydrate burning is very low. So we've got a, hat, a lot of fat in zone one, not as much carbohydrate, very little carbohydrate. And as you progress into the two zones, those two lines begin to merge on each other. Someplace usually in the two zone, for hopefully for the athlete, those lines cross. And so you're now burning mostly carbohydrate, 
late two zone, three zone, four zone into the five zone. Now we're talking about using uh, glycogen for fuel. So the carbohydrate storage form of carbohydrates is being used. And fat is going down in that, in that as we move to the right in the zone. So zone three, fat is getting lower, zone four is lower, carbohydrates going higher and so forth. That's basically what happens throughout those zones. And what we're trying to do is it, this crossover point where fat and carbohydrate, those two lines cross each other, is a critical point. We're trying to move that point as far to the right as we can. That's exactly what Phil Maffetone was trying to do with his 180 minus your age. He was just trying to move that crossover point to the right on this scale. It probably starts down in the one zone, but as we improve our aerobic fitness, that crossover point where fat becomes is still being used predominantly moves to the right. If we can get that really, really far to the right, like the, the end of the two zone, the top end of the two zone, we have made a gigantic improvement in the athlete's metabolic fitness. They can now hold fat metabolism for a long time during exercise, a long, long time. So that, that's one of the goals of exercise in this way is to accomplish that, to get this crossover point between fat and carbohydrate to move to the right. I wish I had the chart where I could show you. It makes it much more obvious because well, I've got the chart shown as me, in poor shape and it, in good shape. <laughs> so I just popping up this screen. Can you see? I do see the it, screen. Yes. This is when I do metabolic testing. So this is an example right. of the goal is a fat. And what you're talking about is that metabolic crossover point. So this isn't. A good exactly. clear one, but you're saying kind of zone two, what we say in Pinoy metabolic testing is where your peak fat burning is. And then you're saying, I think what it, we say is top of zone two is that crossover point where the carbohydrate usage, this purple crosses right. over or yep. like here. That's exactly what we're talking about right there, right yeah. there in that so, charging and crossover point right there. Mm -hmm. the blue and then we line, can red see line what heart rate. Yep. So that's 148 heart rate for that person yep. in Which that range. Really which is really quite good. If they're running, for example, it's a little bit higher heart rate running. It depends on the sport and the athlete, but, but that's really, uh, that, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve right there is move that crossover point as far right as we can. Yeah. The farther right we get it, the better shape you're in. And the way you get it to move to the right is you train mostly zone one and zone two. So down that's, in here. That's the bulk of your training. You spend a lot of time in one and two. That's why Phil was doing 180 minus your age, because it forces you into zone one and two. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can move that crossover point to the right, it becomes... So it would be up here. Exactly. So I, we, I used that, to, my highest I got to when I was testing with new leaf metabolic testing cart was 157, 160, and I was 40 years old. But I, I was training that way for so long that I could get up. You know, that's how I did well in Ironman, because I could be burning fat and feel good because I'd be like 160 heart rate. My metabolic crossover point would be way up there. So it does yeah. work. And I've seen it because I, that's why I love testing. And that's why I bought the Noe testing cart because it's portable and it's now like an app on my iPad or phone. I can test people with the, the metabolic mask, but just mm -hmm. to see these changes. And this test, for example, is a third test I did with someone that it keeps improving because they're doing their marathon training for them down here. And right. then you know, knowing when to add in speed work. I just think it's good to see visually for people, as you're saying, there's a chart. I know what you're talking about. I just was showing it in a webinar I was doing, but how you're you're not burning ever just fat, right? Yeah. See this purple, you're nice. saying you're still burning. It's just this continuous progression that the fuel sources start to dominate one another, but you're not just burning fat or just no, carbs never. down here, but carbs up here. No, that never happens. You're exactly right. The idea is you're you're burning both all the time. Even while we're sitting here talking, we're both burning carbohydrate and fat while we're sitting here talking. As you start exercising, it begins to change. And as you, the chart just showed, eventually they come to the point where carbohydrate becomes a dominant source of fuel and fat becomes less, um, a smaller in, in, uh, increase, in, a smaller dosage of fat is being used for fueling the athlete and as you become up to zone five it becomes extreme to the to the glycogen carbohydrate side and fat is almost down to nothing at that point mm -hmm. so that, that, that chart is great that's exactly what i was trying to explain is what that chart just showed thank you so the carb uses starts to increase 
zone three. And then, so that's glycogen, glycolysis, and then walk our way up to the fuel source is changing. And then let's start to tie into where that lactate fuel source is and how I want to get to lactate testing. Cause that's always asked me, well, can I just get lactate testing threshold instead of this test? Or don't you need to know both? Yeah. Lactate is an interesting, has an interesting history, but just very yeah. briefly, uh, we, we can trace it back to the 1920s, University of Har Harvard University, um, and uh, the professor there who was, was quite well known even to this day, whose name escapes me right now off the top of my head, um, was took a, a muscle from a frog and put it on a device he had uh, and where he could have, he could stimulate the muscle with an electrical, electrical shock. And... Uh, and he, as he did that, of course, what would happen is the muscle would contract when he gives the electrical shock on this little device he had set up uh, on his desk. And uh, But he discovered that when he did that, if he did it repeatedly, really quickly, that the muscle began to seep out a kind of a white uh, liquid, which looked like milk. And so he referred to it as lactate because that's that's the that's a, a term that refers to to a milky looking lactate. substance. So he called it lactate, and he decided about that same time that this was the reason why that muscle fatigue because he kept shocking the muscle, it would eventually get to the point it couldn't contract anymore. It would just it would just droop, even though he kept on shocking it, it wouldn't do anything anymore. So he came to the conclusion that that liquid he was seeing, that white milky substance he called lactate, was causing the muscle to fatigue. That was the conclusion he came to, which was not, which was almost obvious, but that was a common conclusion that you might come up with in that situation. We now know that's not right. Uh, it's now been over 100, 100 years, like I think it was 100 years, I come to think of it, a couple of months ago when he did this test. So for 100 years, We've been, most athletes, most people have anything to do with knowing who hear about lactate, still go back to this idea, that's why I'm fatiguing is because of lactate. You watch the Tour de France on TV and Bob Q. Roll will all, almost always say fatigue is now setting in, he's got too much lactate in his system. That goes back 100 years, it refuses to go away. We now know this is not the cause of fatigue. It's not the cause of fatigue. In fact, lactate is actually a source of fuel for your body. Yeah. Uh, lactate, and I won't go into details on this, but the lactate is taken up into the muscle uh, and reconverted into a, into a source of fuel, which helps to drive the muscle. So it's not your enemy. It's actually your friend. You're not sore the next day because of lactate. You're not fatiguing because of lactate. All these things we think we know are wrong about lactate. However, the one thing we do know about it that's true is it's a good predictor of what's going on with your body. It's a good predictor of something that's happening in your body um, that is very uh, useful in trying to determine how hard the athlete is working. It's just lactate analysis. We, as we're talking right now, we're both using, we're both, both producing lactate. It's very low, less than one probably, or one less, less than one uh, mill, millimoles per, per liter. So it's a very small amount. Uh, but as we start exercising, that lactate begins to increase. At some point, it begins to increase rather rapidly as, as our intensity increases. That point where it begins to increase is about two millimoles per liter, roughly right around there. It may vary a little bit with the individual. So around that point, we start breathing hard. We start feeling the um, sensation of, of fatigue, not because lactate is causing this, but because it's like a marker. It's like something is telling us what's going on with our body, and it's just something we can easily uh, draw out of the blood and measure. So... Um, it becomes a one way of determining your, your zone. So you could say if you're two millimoles of, of lactate, uh, you're probably around the top of your two zone. And so everything below that two millimoles is zone one and zone two. And everything above it is zones three, four, and five. And then we can take it up even higher and we can we can look at it at higher levels. And when what the research tends to say is when we get to about four millimoles, you're you're going what we've typically in the past referred to as anaerobic, which is not a very good word, but it kind of everybody seems to understand that word. So you start breathing really hard. You, you know you can't talk anymore. You're 
uh, you're very focused on just getting breath in as opposed to anything else. That's zone, That's about the start of zone five. So we've got the top of zone two and the bottom of zone five kind of laid out by your lactate. And now we can fill in the other zones. We can fill in one, which is roughly probably around, I don't know, 15, 12, 15 beats below your um, uh, L2, lactate level two. And uh, zone three fits nicely between um, between those two zones. And then we've got zone five, which is above the four millimole mark. So you can set your zones by doing that. Um, I really don't recommend people go out and buy lactate devices just to find this out. Unless you're really into science and you're really a detail-oriented person, I really wouldn't mess with it. I'd go to a lab and have them do it. If you really want to find out, you don't have to do this at all, by the way. If you really want to know, you could do that. But um, if you want to get a, a test done, you know, it's going to cost you some money. I'm not sure how much they're charging these days for those tests. But um, that will help you decide your training zones. And um, you can do it yourself, but it's, there's a long learning curve uh, in doing it. Um, there's also some issues about the, the test equipment. Uh, the protocols that people use, um, there's just a lot of stuff here. It's not like you just prick your finger, take a drop of blood and stick it in the machine and it tells you a number. There's a lot more to it than that. You've got, you've got to know what you're doing. So, but if you if you're into that kind of stuff, great. Go ahead and give it a try. They're not real expensive, but you can you can get one. Um, but it's a very interesting stuff, and it's kind of like helping to define where we're going with intensity zones today. Um, it was had a kind of a re emergence back an emergence back in the 1990s. We were doing a little bit of that. Uh, it didn't last very long. Um, this seems to be already lasting longer than it did in the 90s. But it's it's a good test. You could have it done. You could have other things done at the same time. You could have your VO2 max tested while you're looking at your your VO2 max, your uh, your uh, not your aerobic capacity, but rather your lactate threshold. So you can find all this stuff by one one visit to a lab. It would be expensive. You'd be, cost you a few hundred dollars to get all this done. Interesting information, but not necessary. So if you had a preference to do a lactate threshold test in a lab versus a uh, metabolism test, which would you suggest? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I'd like to know their metabolism probably more than anything else. I'd like to know what's going on with with the fat for fuel because um, I, I see that as being one of the primary things I want an athlete I'm working with to, to be focused on is, is burning fat and uh, Knowing where we are right now and going back and taking a look at it later on, I think would be an extremely good idea. Well, of course, I would suggest metabolic testing because I own the equipment, but Daniel Krumbeck is one of my mentors. He's taught me, he's in this field as well, the metabolism testing. And we were talking about that, that, you know, you're just kind of guessing where your peak fat burning is when you do lactate threshold. Right, because you don't really see. You're just kind of guessing because your lactate is 2.0, then it's 4.0 here that you're predicting that your peak fat burning zone is at that 2.0 lactate. Versus when I can see what we went over in that real test is that here's the data where we start to see that carbohydrate go up and the fat come down, and we can see your peak, and we can keep testing every three months and see those changes. Whereas the lactate. And you'll see that heart rate maybe is higher, but you still don't know. You're just kind of assuming that that fat burning is getting bigger, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know where that crossover point is. Uh, and I'd like to be able to find that out fairly frequently, not like daily but, or even weekly, mm -hmm. but fairly frequently, every few weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, something like mm -hmm. that. I'd like to know where that crossover point is because that's, if I'm working as an athlete, that's one of the main things I'm trying to accomplish is get to that that point where the crossover between fat and carbohydrates move to the right. Mm -hmm. And if I can find a way to measure that and know where we are, it gives me a lot of feedback on what we can be doing in training right now. Maybe we can now, maybe it's time to change and start changing our, our, our protocol, what we're doing for training. Perhaps we need to change that right now. And this, this is one way of finding out when we're at that point. So a couple of thoughts to throw in there. I think going back to the lactate testing device, I think, Part of that is Peter Atia and 
Rhonda Patrick and Huberman, they're all kind of talking about buy this device and test and uh, and find out yourself. But as you're saying, it's very confusing and it's not just go oh, prick a finger while you're in the middle of a workout, see where you are. There's protocols that we need to follow and standardize them so you can retest. Part two is that you, you know, you get the test, figure out where to be, but how to train in those zones. A lot of people are just using their watches. And I find the chest strap is completely different heart rate on my watch versus just using the sensors, the back of the watch as Garmin or heart rate on a Apple watch, for example, right? What do you find with that? I mean, I, I, I agree with 100%. Yeah, I've, I often use my my watch compared with my chest strap while I'm out on the bike, for example. And uh, they seldom agree. They, they can be off quite a, quite a bit of difference. And there's a lot, a lot of lag between them also, especially the, the wrist lagging behind what's going on. So, um, yeah, I think the chest strap is much better. I haven't tried the upper arm strap yet. Um, I forgot which company has that out now, but somebody's got a, yeah, an upper arm strap. Sally I haven't tried that one. Those. Sorry? Sally Edwards was doing that for her heart rate training. I know for schools and classes, but it was a a band on your arm, but I never yeah. tried it. Yeah, yeah I, I never just, tried that. So I can't speak yeah, I just yet. was saying I, I was doing it yesterday. I didn't put my chest strap, went for a bike right up a hill out here. And I knew I was like 160, 170. I was, oh, I was like, oh, can't get to the top of the hill. And my watch was saying 120. This is not right. So those are just not, so many people I, I find do not wear chest strap is my point. And they think they're doing certain type of training, but I don't think they're really getting accurate data because everyone seems to be going by their devices, not a real heart rate strap to measure their intensity. Yeah. Yeah. It's you got to be care, really careful with wearable stuff. Of course, of course, chest strap is wearable also, but it's, it's, it's been shown to be accurate. Most of the stuff we have is is, un, is un, unfortunately not really accurate. You're getting bad information sometimes. And that makes it difficult for the athlete to know what they should believe and what they should be doing. Uh, and one thing, this could be started down a pathway here that that's kind of a sore spot with me. You know, my Garmin is always telling me I got to train harder. Um, you know, I come in from a ride and it's always giving me this information about you. Now you need, you need 18 hours to recover from this workout. And, and uh, if you just train just a little bit harder, basically it's telling me you'll you'll improve, and, and it's just on and on and on. It's like where how are they coming? You know, it's telling me I'm adapted to my altitude now. It's, it tells me like every six weeks I'm adapted to this new altitude, which hasn't changed. I meant to say I live at 4,500 feet. It hasn't changed in five years, but it's always telling me I'm now adapted to it. And you know it's just like ridiculous stuff it keeps coming up with, and so you you. Uh, Anything your wearable device tells you must be taken with a grain of salt. I, I would be very skeptical of what you're being told. Thank you. Well, you, as I was waiting for you to come on the show, I, I was ready a little early before our time, and I was saying the same thing. So thank you. Because I said, you know, these are just devices. They're not 100% accurate to get my sleep score. I need to have electrodes on my head while I sleep. And to get my heart rate variability score, it's wearing a chest strap. So Kind of leads me into the next section that we'll get to is rest and recovery. As I didn't say to you, you don't know my story, but I stopped racing in 2013. I got adrenal exhaustion, kind of led me to become a nutritional therapy practitioner and a left hand practitioner to help athletes avoid burnout and breakdown of the body systems that I can't race. My body won't go that hard and that fast, any long distance stuff. But the train hard, recover harder, you know, the training stress load variability, overreaching, anything you want to share on the importance of rest and recovery and avoiding overreaching for athletes. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is another gigantic topic. In five minutes. Um, Just kidding. I, I don't I I probably I talk a lot about these sorts of things in my books about um value of recovery. Because athletes seem to think, I don't know how people come up with these ideas that they need to push themselves to their limits as much, often as they can, as much as they can, and then take as little recovery as they can, because that's how you become a good athlete, become faster is by doing that. It's not the way you do it. In fact, I've coached many athletes over the years, and one of the first things I always ask them after about a month is, 
what are you seeing different about right now compared to what you were doing before a month ago before you start before I started coaching you? The most common answer I get is I'm training less, resting less, but I'm getting faster. And that's that's almost always what the athlete would tell me. And it's just simply because they've kept themselves worn out all the time. They were always pushing their limits. And that's that's not the way you train for an event like this. It should be just exactly the opposite of that. You should be doing lots and lots and lots of easy training and just a little bit of very fast training, um, you know, minuscule amount compared to the volume of high or low intensity training. So um so that that's a that's a particular topic of interest for me is that um, I spend my a lot of my time talking with athletes about your training too hard. In fact, this is interesting. I was asked to write an article for a, a magazine here. I don't know, it's been six months ago, and so the editor wanted to know what my topic was going to be. So I wrote a paragraph, and it started out with by saying, "This is what the how the paragraph is going to start." And if I write the article, it's going to start off by saying, "You're training too hard." And it goes on, then the article will go on to explain why that's the case. Well, the editor wrote back to me and said, I'm wrong. So he's not going to publish my piece because he didn't want to report things that were in, were false. So I lost the, which is not a big deal to me, lost the assignment to write an article for him. Um, but it, it, that's just the way we think. It's, everybody thinks, we, you know, you've got to push. It reminds me that in the 1950s, um, movies there were a lot of movies, the 1940s and 50s, there were a lot of movies about people trying to accomplish um, remarkable things like the story of Jim Thorpe trying to become the best football player of all time back in the early 1900s and how he, so they made a movie about it and how he pushed himself to his limits and every day he was exhausted. And every day he would fall asleep, he would just crash on the bed and fall asleep and get up the next morning and push himself as hard as he could all day long again, day after day after day after day. That was how we, we still see the world that way, unfortunately. That that has been gone for, in reality, among real athletes for decades. But mostly people still see it the same way. You've got to push yourself to your limit on a daily basis. Otherwise, you're not going to get any better. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a sad story. That you, it can't, you can't get people to change their minds about this. It's extremely difficult. You know, Phil's idea about 180 minus your age, going back to that again, is a great idea here because it says, hey, you got to do this. And if you do this, I know you're going to be you're going to be using fat for fuel. That's and that's what we're trying to accomplish. And there are other ways, you know, we you may, may read about nose breathing instead of mouth breathing anymore. It's the same idea. If you breathe through your nose, you, you're burning fat for fuel. Breathe through your mouth. Yeah. If you have to open your mouth to breathe, you're probably starting to burn carbohydrate, glycogen for fuel. Um, another thing you can talk the talk test, you know, if you can, I, I, one I use is if you can't count to a thousand six, you know, thousand, start by saying a thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, thousand four, thousand five, thousand six. If you can't make it to a thousand six, you're burning carbohydrate. If you can do it all the way to a thousand six, you're probably burning fat. So there's various ways of doing this, but the whole idea is to get the athlete to burn as much fat for fuel as possible, which is, this is like a gigantic topic we keep coming back to. But nevertheless, that's, that's the one that I'm always stuck on with, with athletes is you, you, you train too hard. You need to train easier. And I, I, it's very hard to convince anybody that's, that's true. Yeah. And people can read a lot about that in your book. And I know I have lots of videos I've done on that on, you know, chronic stress externally and hidden sources of internal stressors accumulate and lead to what we call metabolic chaos. So just hormone imbalances and immune dysfunction, leaky gut, gut health issues, and the whole gamut can happen from doing too much of everything all combined really breaks you out as my experience wasn't really training. It was just, I was running my own fitness studio burning the candle at both ends, trying to, you know, get up at three 30 in the morning and you're not done till eight o'clock at night. And it's not just exercise. It's the rest of your life. Look like exactly right. There's, we all have lots of stuff in our lives anymore. It seems like, and that sometimes prevents us from becoming the athlete we'd like to be. It's mm-hmm. unfortunate, but that's just the way life seems to be evolving in Western society. Yeah. And the other stressor kind of goes in the next section is, is, uh, Aging athletes, how we lose that, you know, lack of speed, the power and the strength and how I always say we need to embrace how we age, not complain about it that, oh, this is, I'm getting older. I can't do this, can't do that. But how we need to adjust how we train as we age 
as well as nutrition, that is another topic too, is going into stressors that we were, you know, not eating enough and we're doing too much fasting and all that. So what changes do you see overall that we should adjust as we age for men and women? Yeah. Um, another huge topic. <laughs> An hour topic uh, there too, in five minutes. Yeah. Um, Highlight. Well, I, I think for, I, I just read a research study a few days ago that found that something like 50% of the food sold in grocery stores in the U.S. is ultra-processed food, potato chips, hot dogs, uh, all the sugary products, you know, all the stuff you find in the middle of the grocery store. We tend to be eating an awful lot of that stuff anymore as Americans. I'm not talking about athletes now in general and specifically, but more about us as a, as a, as a country. We're eating just way too much ultra-processed foods. Um, my idea has always been that I would like to move back to being as much as I can like my ancestors. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't have access to ultra processed food. That was that's something new. Your grandmother, maybe your great grandmother nowadays, it kind of depends, would not know what this is. If you pulled out this food and showed it to your great grandmother and she didn't know what it was, you probably shouldn't eat it. Eat it. It's just it's, it's stuff that um, we're not supposed to be eating. And they make it that, you know, it's about the unhealthiest thing you could possibly eat. And it's 50% of what we eat in this country is the unhealthiest stuff you could possibly eat. What makes it unhealthy? Well, it's, it's full of sugar. It's, it's got no fiber. It's, it's got a, flavors added to it because they've been shown to stimulate appetite and desire to eat. And it's got all kinds of chemicals in it that are usually like four or five, six syllable words. Um, you know, the stuff is just awful, but people eat it. My, my, my design about my diet is to eat something that is, is, um, really old, Mm -hmm. going back to stone age. What did our ancestors eat? You know, they were allowed around long, long, for far longer than our grocery stores have been around. They've been around hundreds of thousands of years. Um, they weren't eating ultra processed food by any means. They were eating fruits, vegetables, animal products, lean, lean meats. Um, and this was the stuff they ate. That's, mm-hmm. that's how we evolved. We evolved to eat those kinds of foods, not all the stuff with the sugar and all the flavors added into it and comes in a plastic package and so forth. We weren't designed to eat that. That, that not only makes you old, it actually makes you less fit. You're going to become fatter and less fit by eating this stuff, this junk. And yet we're taught to eat this stuff and it's, it tastes so good. It's hard to resist and, it, and it's cheap. How can you go wrong when it's cheap and you taste good? Well, so yeah, we're just, we're, we're in a real dilemma here in our society about, about this. Something like, I've forgotten the numbers now, like a third of Americans are diabetic. Um, a third of Americans are diabetic. Amazing. Just blows me away. And something like 50% are pre-diabetic. It's just amazing what we're doing to ourselves. Um, And unfortunately, athletes, athletics, athleticism does not end that. It's a great step in the right direction, but it doesn't end that. We're still stuck with eating, even athletes eating junk food um, because they think they can get away with it. They exercise, therefore they can eat junk. It's not the way it works. Your body doesn't work like that. Your body cannot overcome a terrible diet. Uh, No matter how much exercise you do, it's not going to, it's not going to change, turn this around. You're going to age faster. You're going to have lots more problems as you get older. You know, things that that Americans uh, experience like like diabetes, like heart disease, Mm -hmm. like cancer. These are the sorts of things you're setting yourself up for by eating such a crappy diet. Um, So, you know, so, I try to get back to where my ancestors were. You know, it's vegetables, fruits, lean animal products, um, foods that you can that you can go out and pick off a uh, off a tree or pull up out of the ground yourself and eat it. That's the stuff I, I like to try to eat, and I think it's good for for you not only as an athlete but also as a as just a person. You'll you'll be healthier and live longer and have fewer visits to your doctor's office if you do that. Yeah. For sure. And that's why I love testing. I do, you know, look at functional lab testing, look at your insulin levels, your A1C, your just blood chemistry panel. And just because you're 
exercising doesn't mean you have the best health inside. So that's why I was say on this podcast, being fit and healthy right. from the inside out, because you can see that for athletes who can right? now exercise a bad diet. Yeah, you can't you can't beat it uh, by exercising more or faster or whatever it is you think is the solution. You you can't do it. The yeah. only the only solution is to change your diet to something which is basic. You know, I'd like to write a book someday on the ancient athlete, what what their lifestyle was like, the Paleolithic athlete before the onset of farming and towns and communities and all this sort of stuff and grocery stores. You know, what was life like? Because they're they're the optimal athlete. Their their lifestyle was just optimal for being an athlete. They trained exactly as we should train today. Mm-hmm. They didn't do a lot of fat. They don't didn't go out and just run as hard as they could all the time. They went out and they ran very slowly, chasing an animal. Because what are we good at as humans? We're good at endurance. We're not good at speed. We're one of the slowest animals on the planet. But we're great at endurance. We're one of the best animals on the planet when it comes to endurance. So we could, our ancestors could run down a, an animal uh, by simply just running long, slow distance. Just, just keep chasing the animal, check, checking for hoof prints or whatever it may be, and eventually you'll find the animal collapsed underneath the tree someplace out of breath because it just can't keep up with the, the pace you're putting into it, and, and the hunt ends. That's how we. That's how we evolved. We didn't evolve to do sprints. You did sprints only at the very end when you're trying to catch the animal, not not the entire time. You. You went as slow as you could and as easy as you could the entire time. That's how we evolved to, to operate as athletes. That's the perfect athlete. What did the athlete do? They, then they carried the kill home or they carry the vegetables and fruits or wherever they've gathered back to the cave or wherever their, their, their camp mud is. And they prepare the food, the meal, and they eat. And what do they do at the end of the day? They dance. They dance around the fire and they celebrate the fact that they were successful that day pat each other on the back. So they got this social thing going Gratitude. also and they go to sleep for the night and they get up the next day and they do it all over again. So it's just like, you know, th- this, that's, that's the lifestyle we were designed to live. We were not designed to do the stuff we do sit on your, your butt for 18 hours a day and, you know, watch television or whatever it is we do. We weren't designed for this stuff. We were designed to be like our ancestors, just a very basic lifestyle. Yeah. Love that. A great book. You're kind of saying some of the quotes, but Michael Pollan, I forgot his name. Michael Pollan, The Food Rules is just a, one quote on each page. It's a very simple read. If people want to know uh, great ways to, the food rules book is I read like 20 years ago, but you know, eat what your great grandmother ate. It was one quote and five ingredients or less and just has simple things like that. Easiest read, good gift to get people still around. All right, so we have one minute to answer those questions. So speed, power, strength. As we age, what's one thing you would adjust in training for people that are over 50 years old? What should we do? Anything different? Yeah, I'd be very concerned about strength. Um, as we get older, we, we lose muscle mass. Um, and in some sports, especially cycling, um, we lose bone density, uh, osteoporosis. So we've got we've got this double head double edged sword, double headed animal. I don't know how you describe that, but anyway, we've got this thing. It's, it's coming at us in old age, and we need to you know if, if the person is a, is a runner like a triathlete, they they probably don't have to worry too much about their legs. Their their legs are going to be great. Um, muscle mass is going to be good. Bones are going to be nice and dense because of all the running and so forth. Upper body, not so much. Probably need some upper body strength work for the triathlete, aging triathlete, because those bones also become fragile. And the next time you crash on your bike, you may wind up a lot of broken bones uh, because of the uh, the bones being fragile. So aging, now, I think one of the things I'm very concerned about is is athletes having good um, good strength, and that strength blossoms over to not only muscle but also to bone. So that's where my focus would be. Hmm. Great. Well, I know we've got other things going on today, so we're going to let you go. So where can people learn more from you and get their book, Training Bible? You can go to my my website, uh, joefrieltraining.com. And uh, there I've got blogs that go back to 2007, or I think something like that. Wow. And and all my books are available there and so forth. So anyway, that's where I would send people. 
And then what are you, you're working on some articles, books, speaking engagement, what else? So I'm working on a book right now. Uh, it'll probably be out in about when, this coming winter. I've almost got my part of the book written, but I'm bringing in some experts to, to include some pieces in it um, on various topics. So we have the, the horse's mouth talking about the topic, like Stephen Seiler talking about zone two training, for example. So I'm still now working with all of them, trying to get them corralled. They're all going the same direction. And I'm each chapter starts with a story about one of my athletes I coached over the years and how that athlete is, is um, related to this topic in, in this chapter. And so I tell their story, which I had then to get their permission to do this and check details of them on things that happened that I've forgotten. And so it's been a rather long process to get this whole book done, but it'll be probably this coming winter. So end of 2024 or 2025 yeah. sounds space age, but I, I hope, I hope the winter of 24 it's out, but you never can Great. tell. <laughs> yeah. Well, good for you. We'll keep it up and hope you're enjoying life and getting the outdoor time and nature when traveling everything you love to do. I'm getting out an awful lot right now. You bet. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate all your knowledge and wisdom and following your pap- passion. Thank you, Debbie. Enjoy talking with you. Good, good questions. Good, good, uh, good interview. Hey guys, it's Debbie. And if you like what you listen to and you're curious and want to learn more on how you can be a health optimizer and take ownership of your health in the future when you are 70, 80, 90 years old, let's talk. Head to debbiepotts.net and set up a free discovery call with me to learn more about my personalized coaching packages as my health investigation package or my VIP package, where we dive into a program together for six months to help learn what you can do to be the best version of yourself. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at debbiepotts.net. You can help us continue and grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and see you next time.